One Foundations Endless Dating How long is too long to stay in the dating game? The primary reason for the psychological unease and emotional instability of so many modern women and to a different extent modern men resides in the irresolvable tension between our ancient biological inheritance and the relatively recent emergence of the high-tech rootless world of unparalleled mate choice we now inhabit. It would shock most people if they were to be transported back in time to when humans lived in small tribes to see young girls having babies at 14 and again at 14 years and 9.5 months. There are subsistence cultures that behave this way today. The bulk of our prehistory was spent in conditions like this so it is no wonder that our brains are having trouble coping with a radically different environment where childbirth is routinely put off until the mid-30s, if at all, and rejection by a woman no longer means banishment to the icy wastelands of celibate metadeath when a man need merely walk to the other side of a bar to try again. One consequence of this new paradigm is the absurd number of years spent in the dating circuit. Women are designed by nature to begin the next generation not much older than age 25. Her risk of miscarriage or fetal abnormalities increases each year after that and exponentially so after 35. Her body begins to wear down which affects how much energy she can devote to raising small children. If she has not found a suitable mate by her late twenties she will begin to notice that those powerful feelings of infatuation she felt for crushes and she was younger, perfectly created by evolution to bring a man and woman together to make babies, now seem muted and foggy. This in turn will sap the dating experience of the best things it has going for it, namely, the spontaneity, the euphoria, the intense drive to connect and leave behind a desiccated simulacra of dating that more closely resembles haggling over a business deal or suffering through a job interview. Overthinking replaces lust. It is an embittering realization. Men, too, have had to adjust under the new system. Anthropologically speaking, it wasn't so long ago that a man, or his immediate kin, blew his entire wad of hard-earned social and material capital wooing one or two women over the course of his natural lifespan. In a pre-birth control age when the first deflowering blast inside a woman often meant conception followed by years of fatherhood there were limits on just how many female sex partners the average man could accumulate in a lifetime. The rigorous experience of winning over and keeping the best quality woman he could afford and then providing for their kids soon thereafter meant that serial dating was not a typical feature of life. Dating 40 or 50 different women in a year and jumping haphazardly in and out of three-month mini-relationships is a peculiarity of modern life for which men are not optimized. The energy requirement is enormous. Men have adapted to this stressful cycle of meat attract close keep by either settling and marrying the first girl that would have them, usually high school sweethearts who have not lived enough to acquire unrealistically picky standards, or by hardening themselves against the judgment of women and learning to play the numbers game. The game begot the player. In the gigantic atomized urban tribe of any big city playing the numbers is not the high-risk strategy it once was for our distant male ancestors who were often locked out of any future matings when a pickup attempt went awry and the target or cock block would run and tell the whole tribe what a loser he is. Today, the proximity of exes has very little impact on potential future conquests. For men, this has bought them virtually unlimited opportunity to get laid. For women, this has robbed them of one of their most potent weapons in ensuring that only the fittest males get access to their vaginas, the withering ostracization of their sexual rejection. On the flip side, men have lost confidence in the fidelity of their chosen partners, while women have gained unstigmatized sexual freedom allowing them to play the field until the perfect man finally arrives to sweep them off their feet. I do not think the current reality of endless dating can last. Something must give. Either humans will evolve into different social animals capable of withstanding decades of hookups and fragmentary relationships without turning to the comforts of cats and internet porn, or those people who serially date and delay childbirth will not have enough kids and natural selection will remove them from the gene pool as a failed experiment. Either way, change is in the air. The fundamental premise. Eggs are expensive, sperm is cheap. Every psychological dynamic you see playing out in mass societies liberated from artificial constraints on the sexual market flows from this premise. This means, 
as a systemic matter, women are coddled, men are upbraided. Women are victims, men are victimizers. Women need a leg up, men need to man up. Women have advocacy groups, men have equal opportunity violations. A woman subjected to the indignity of eavesdropping on a tame joke about dongles makes national news, while the chilling fact that 95% of all workplace deaths are suffered by men barely pings the media consciousness. It is what it is, and it will never change so long as humans are a sexually reproducing species. All the laws in the world can at best only paper over the very primal compulsion of people to value the life of the average woman more than the life of the average man, and sympathize accordingly. Railing against it is akin to shaking a fist at sunspots and gamma rays. It's therefore folly or self-serving disingenuousness to act like there's some moral high ground to stake out by imparting culpable agency to an indifferent, organically emergent biomechanical phenomenon. Rationalizing favoritism toward women as some sort of payback for male privilege, or refusing to acknowledge this favoritism altogether, is an example of the cognitive calisthenics and evasive sophistry most people will indulge to avoid grappling with the cold, black void of an uncaring evolutionary replication machine. If you are a man, know that the moment you were born the universe had it in for you. The deck was stacked. The deal was raw. Your expendability was programmed into your wet code before you gained self-awareness. The world's cape of genes can rebuild with the seed of one man should catastrophe strike, but each woman lost is a lethal blow to the repopulation project. In sober moments free of maudlin introspection, you will understand there is no other game to play save this one. This is why to live as a man is to take what you want. Not to wait for it to be given to you. Because it will never be given. Not to anticipate the empathy of the overseers. Because they will never empathize. Not to expect the coddling of the crowd. Because they will never coddle. Not to assume the wagon circling of kindreds. Because they will never circle for you. You got the short stick, now what? Do you contemplate it and hope for a longer one? No. You sharpen it and jab it into the heart of every obstacle that sets itself in your way. Double standards. You hear it all the time from people who are getting shafted by reality, it's so unfair that guys get to do X with impunity while girls doing X suffer social stigma. They think by bitching like this and attempting to shame those who would live in harmony with double standards they can alter people's behavior into something more to their liking, i.e., a non-status-driven, non-materialistic. Non-craven utopia of perfect loving LTRs where no one is left out and no one gets dumped and everyone has a soulmate and enough positive life-affirming experiences to share with their Yenta friends in recipe-swapping blogs devoted to covering the fascinating minutiae of their funny, exciting, sexy, touching, poignant, growth-oriented lives. Then there are those who, when called out on their inconsistencies, deploy a swarm of sophistry intended to obfuscate and deny the existence of double standards because they are beneficiaries of them. Acknowledging these truths would mean coming to terms with the fact that they, like everyone else, have at their core an animal nature. Fuck that noise. The truth of the matter is that double standards are necessary if you want to be halfway competent in your dealings with men and women. As the author of Looking Out for Hashtag One and Winning Through Intimidation wrote, If you deny reality it will automatically work against you, asterisk. Double standards are fixed features of life as a sexually reproducing social organism. The modern career woman is miserable because she is constantly locking horns with men who won't value her for her career achievement as much as for her hourglass figure and bedroom skills, while these same men admire and respect career dominance by other men. Her refusal to come to grips with this essential double standard explains why so many hard-charging women have turned their backs on their own femininity and lost the art of female coquettishness and submissiveness. Alpha men have responded by fucking and leaving these domineering gender imposters for cute waitresses. Betas have responded in their own way by assuming the doormat position and giving these feminists exactly what they claim they want. The same goes for sluts. A man who sleeps with many women gets high fives from his buddies and sexual interest from girls who can't help their burning loins. 
But girls who sleep around are socially ostracized, used by men and shunned by women. It has always been and it will always be as long as a woman has 400 eggs to a man's nearly infinite number of sperm. Parents will treat their sons and daughters differently when dispensing advice on how to deal with the opposite sex and all the harpies with their multiple humanities degrees shrieking equalist platitudes to the high heavens will never change this. It's one thing to bloviate from a comfy tenured perch while your lesbian lover sucks Ben wa balls out of your cooch from under the desk, it's quite another to entrust the welfare of your children with the twisted lies of the bitterati. Asterisk pretty girls have some leeway with this rule. At least for a while. Ha! A handy pocket guide to the most common double standards. Male slut equals Lothario. Female slut equals desperate. Male CEO equals alpha. Female CEO equals bitch. Male model equals silly. Female model equals alpha. Male nerd equals loser. Female nerd equals cute. Young male death equals statistic. Young female death equals tragedy. Male nurse equals beta. Female nurse equals agreeable. Male stripper equals clown. Female stripper equals desirable. Male sports star equals role model. Female sports star equals butch. Latest Baumeister paper apports CH concept of the sexual market. Baumeister, the primary co-author behind the seminal 2004 paper titled Sexual Economics, Sex as Female Resource for Social Exchange in Heterosexual Interactions, has released online the latest addition to that work, titled Sexual Economics, Culture, Men, and Modern Sexual Trends. Another steely-eyed examination of the sexes that pretty much validates the core chateau hardest concept of the existence of a merciless sexual market and its primacy among all markets. I was planning to write a sole synopsis and commentary on the recent study, but others, like Mangan, back from hiatus, have done a good job covering the essential hypotheses and conclusions in the paper, so instead I'll post in addition, in the near future, an email from a reader who forwarded to CH his astute objections and comments to the original Baumeister paper in an email sent to the author. I don't know if Baumeister replied. Quick aside, Mangan asks a related question regarding a prominent claim in the Baumeister paper that men supported the entrance of women into the workforce to increase men's sexual access, is there a direct relationship between looser morals and more women in public life? I would bet that there is, and that a trend toward higher female participation in the workforce, and particularly in government and similar social gatekeeper occupations, is one of the crucial indicators that a nation is beginning the downward spiral into stasis and eventual decline. Continuing, some choice quotes, with editor commentary, pulled from the latest Baumeister slash Voss, a woman, paper to give you a flavor for its contents. In simple terms, we propose that in sex, Women are the suppliers and men constitute the demand, Baumeister and Voss 2004. Hence the anti-democratic, seemingly paradoxical sex ratio findings that Regnerus describes. When women are in the minority, the sexual marketplace conforms to their preferences, committed relationships, widespread virginity, faithful partners, and early marriage. For example, American colleges in the 1950s conformed to that pattern. In our analysis, women benefit in such circumstances because the demand for their sexuality exceeds the supply. In contrast, when women are the majority, such as on today's campuses as well as in some ethnic minority communities, things shift toward what men prefer, plenty of sex without commitment, delayed marriage, extradiatic copulations, and the like. Ed, yep, life has been good for those of us who know the score. Sexual marketplaces take the shape they do because nature has biologically built a disadvantage into men, a huge desire for sex that makes men dependent on women. Men's greater desire puts them at a disadvantage, just as when two parties are negotiating a possible sale or deal, the one who is more eager to make the deal is in a weaker position than the one who is willing to walk away without the deal. Ed, this is why practiced male aloofness is attractive to women. It signals that the man is holding a stronger market position, and that his goods are therefore valuable. 
Women certainly desire sex too, but as long as most women desire it less than most men, women have a collective advantage, and social roles and interactions will follow scripts that give women greater power than men, Baumeister et al. 2001. Ed. Culture emerges from sexually differentiated genetic roots. We have even concluded that the cultural suppression of female sexuality throughout much of history and across many different cultures has largely had its roots in the quest for marketplace advantage, see Baumeister and Twenge 2002. Women have often sustained their advantage over men by putting pressure on each other to restrict the supply of sex available to men. As with any monopoly or cartel, restricting the supply leads to a higher price. Recent work has found that across a large sample of countries today, the economic and political liberation of women is positively correlated with greater availability of sex, Baumeister and Mendoza, 2011. Thus, men's access to sex has turned out to be maximized not by keeping women in an economically disadvantaged and dependent condition, but instead by letting them have abundant access and opportunity. Ed. Was the sexual and feminist revolution fomented by undersexed beta males? A case can be made. In an important sense, the sexual revolution of the 1970s was itself a market correction. Once women had been granted wide opportunities for education and wealth, they no longer had to hold sex hostage, Baumeister and Twenge 2002. Ed, that is, they no longer had to suffer the indignity of beta provider courtship. Now that they had the resources, it was open season on alpha male cock hopping. The sexual revolution appears to have backfired on beta males expecting a bigger slice of the snatch pie. What does all this mean for men? The social trends suggest the continuing influence of a stable fact, namely the strong desire of young men for sexual activity. As the environment has shifted, men have simply adjusted their behavior to find the best means to achieve this same goal. Back in 1960, it was difficult to get sex without getting married or at least engaged, and so men married early. To be sure, this required more than being willing to bend the knee, declare love, and offer a ring. To qualify as marriage material, a man had to have a job or at least a strong prospect of one, such as based on an imminent college degree. The man's overarching goal of getting sex thus motivated him to become a respectable stakeholder contributing to society. The fact that men became useful members of society as a result of their efforts to obtain sex is not trivial, and it may contain important clues as to the basic relationship between men and culture see Baumeister 2010. Although this may be considered an unflattering characterization, and it cannot at present be considered a proven fact, we have found no evidence to contradict the basic general principle that men will do whatever is required in order to obtain sex, and perhaps not a great deal more. Ed, that last clause is critical. Men will always take the path of least resistance to sex. It is up to women to make that path more difficult if they want to extract more concessions from men. One of us characterized this in a previous work as, if women would stop sleeping with jerks, men would stop being jerks. If in order to obtain sex men must become pillars of the community, or lie, or amass riches by fair means or foul, or be romantic or funny, then many men will do precisely that. This puts the current sexual free-for-all on today's college campuses in a somewhat less appealing light than it may at first seem. Ed, what's interesting and unspoken here is that the sexual free-for-all is chugging along nicely well beyond and outside of the college years, with the difference being that, in their twenties and thirties, a select number of fewer men, let's call them, alpha males, are enjoying the ample premarital rewards of sexually available women. Giving young men easy access to abundant sexual satisfaction deprives society of one of its ways to motivate them to contribute valuable achievements to the culture. Ed, damn, I'm torn. Do I want a thriving society or easier access to sex? Yeah, I'll take the latter and leave the self-sacrifice required of the former for the anti-poolside chumps. The changes in gender politics since 1960 can be seen as involving a giant trade, in which both genders yielded something of lesser importance to them in order to get something they wanted more, Baumeister and Voss 2004. As Regnerus states, 
partly based on our own extensive survey of research findings, men want sex, indeed more than women want it, Baumeister et al. 2001. Women, meanwhile, want not only marriage but also access to careers and preferential treatment in the workplace. Ed, women are the reproductively more valuable sex, and so it makes sense that evolution would have gifted women with an oversized entitlement complex and the inability to engage in self-criticism. The giant trade thus essentially involved men giving women not only easy access but even preferential treatment in the huge institutions that make up society, which men created. Ed, but the grand bargain did not work out as intended for the masses of beta males who acquiesced to the new girl order. While alpha males certainly saw more action from liberated women, the average Joe did not. Instead, all the average Joe got in return for sacrificing his workplace status in hopes of easier sex was a heaping helping of humiliation and wage stagnation and anti-Joe animus, which continues at an accelerated pace to this day. This is a critical distinction I would like to see Baumeister address. Today most schools, universities, corporations, scientific organizations, governments, and many other institutions have explicit policies to protect and promote women. It is standard practice to hire or promote a woman ahead of an equally qualified man. Most large organizations have policies and watchdogs that safeguard women's interests and ensure that women gain preferential treatment over men. Parallel policies or structures to protect men's interests are largely non-existent and in many cases are explicitly prohibited. Legal scholars, for example, point out that any major new law is carefully scrutinized by feminist legal scholars who quickly criticize any aspect that could be problematic or disadvantageous to women, and so all new laws are women-friendly. Nobody looks out for men, and so the structural changes favoring women and disadvantaging men have accelerated, Baumeister and Voss 2004. Even today, the women's movement has been a story of women demanding places and preferential treatment in the organizational and institutional structures that men create, rather than women creating organizations and institutions themselves. Almost certainly, this reflects one of the basic motivational differences between men and women, which is that female sociality is focused heavily on one-to-one -one relationships, whereas male sociality extends to larger groups' networks of shallower relationships, e.g. Baumeister and Sommer 1997, Baumeister 2010. Crudely put, women hardly ever create large organizations or social systems. That fact can explain most of the history of gender relations, in which the gender near equality of prehistorical societies was gradually replaced by progressive inequality, not because men banded together to oppress women, but because cultural progress arose from the men's sphere with its large networks of shallow relationships. While the women's sphere remained stagnant because its social structure emphasized intense one-to-one -one relationships to the near exclusion of all else, see Baumeister. 2010, all over the world and throughout history, and prehistory, the contribution of large groups of women to cultural progress has been vanishingly small. Ed, what do you think will happen to a nation's cultural progress and it goes out of its way to give preferential treatment to its women who, as a sex, prefer tawdry one-to-one -one relationships to men's preference for the growth potential in large shallow relationships. That's right, the economy and the culture come more and more to reflect women's preferences. Result, progress that is the hallmark of rising empires grinds to a halt. Why have men acquiesced so much in giving women the upper hand in society's institutions? It falls to men to create society, because women almost never create large organizations or cultural systems. It seems foolish and self-defeating for men then to meekly surrender advantageous treatment in all these institutions to women. Moreover, despite many individual exceptions, in general and on average men work harder at their jobs in these institutions than women, thereby enabling men to rise to the top ranks. As a result, women continue to earn less money and have lower status than men, which paradoxically is interpreted to mean that women's preferential treatment should be continued and possibly increased, see review of much evidence in Baumeister 2010. Modern society is not far from embracing explicit policies of equal pay for less work, as one of us recently proposed. 
Regardless of that prospect, it appears that preferential treatment of women throughout the workforce is likely to be fairly permanent. Because of women's lesser motivation and ambition, they will likely never equal men in achievement, and their lesser attainment is politically taken as evidence of the need to continue and possibly increase preferential treatment for them. Ed, the preferences shall continue until morale improves. But this pattern of male behavior makes more sense if we keep in mind that getting sex is a high priority for men, especially young men. Being at a permanent disadvantage in employment and promotion prospects, as a result of affirmative action policies favoring women, is certainly a cost to young men, but perhaps not a highly salient one. What is salient is that sex is quite readily available. As Regnerus reports, even a man with dismal career prospects, e.g., having dropped out of high school, can find a nice assortment of young women to share his bed. Mangan makes a valid objection to this Baumeister theory that affirmative action for women increased men's sexual access by noting that it was likely contraception and cost of sex reducing technology, the pill, abortion, and penicillin, which opened the floodgates to free love. I put free in quotes because in reality, the sexual revolution did not benefit all men equally. Alpha males got the lion's share of premarital sex from economically self sufficient women. Beta males suffered more than usual, having to endure watching from the sidelines as alpha males cleaned up, while simultaneously being deprived of the best leverage they had in the sexual market, their promise of marital resources. However, I do think Baumeister is onto something true, in that increased female workplace participation meant that men with reasonably high status jobs had a lot more fleshy temptresses from whom to conveniently choose and that women must certainly have felt less restricted in their sexuality once they were meeting their own financial needs and could afford to risk happy dalliances with sexually desirable, but more non-committal, alpha males. Again, Le Chateau was on top of all this years ago, when we proposed a sea change in the American cultural landscape heralded by the coming of the four five six sirens of the sexual apocalypse. Effective and widely available contraceptives, the pill, condom, and the de facto contraceptive abortion. Easy peasy, no fault divorce. Women's economic independence, hurtling towards women's economic advantage if the college enrollment ratio is any indication. Rigged feminist inspired laws that have caused a disincentivizing of marriage for men and an incentivizing of divorce for women. Penicillin, reduced the cost of contracting STDs. Widely available hardcore porn. I added numbers 5 and 6 to the list of sexual apocalypse sirens, because they seem to me just as important to understanding how the sexual market changed in the last 50 or so years. So, a crib sheet of quippy replies if you ever needed to send a feminist or manbub howling with indignation. 1. The pill. 2. No-fault divorce. 3. Working women. 4. Man-hating feminism. 5 penicillin. 6. Porn. Toss into a social salad bowl already brimming with an influx of non-European immigrants thanks to the 1965 Soft Genocide Act, mix thoroughly, and voila, a huge, inexorable, relentless leftward shift in American politics, an explosion of single moms, wage stagnation, government growth, upper-class childlessness, lower-class dysgenics, and a creaking, Slow deterioration in the foundational vigor of the nation and the gutting of the pride of her people. Into this pot pie of portent throw in the Skittles man, bring the movies man, na man, and disappeared again man, for whom girls have always swooned but who now, thanks to relaxed pressure from women themselves requiring men to put a ring on it before getting any huggy or kissy, and the incentivizing of risky sexual behavior by government policy and contraceptive technology could enjoy sex without the entanglement of marriage or gainful employment. Game, for all the shit it gets from the usual suspects, was just a rational response to a radically altered playing field. It didn't cause this calamity, it just profited from it. Meanwhile, beta males are left scratching their block-like skulls, wondering what the fuck just happened. Back to Baumeister. Nowadays young men, ed, correction, alpha males, can skip the wearying detour of getting education and career prospects to qualify for sex. Nor does he have to get married and accept all those costs, including promising to share his lifetime earnings and forego other women forever. 
female sex partners are available without all that. Ed, to those men with charm in the game. So maybe the young men don't care that much about how the major social institutions in the world of work have become increasingly rigged to favor women. Sex has become free and easy. This is today's version of the opiate of the male masses.